So. All right, sounds good. Thanks. Of course, yeah, we're gonna make it make it nice and fun. <laughs> Welcome, welcome everyone. Got a very exciting session right now coming up. Sorry. <laughs> Sneak preview. I know, right? <laughs> Tisa. I know. Hope everyone is still rallying for this session and I think we have a few more after it and then we're done. And then it's on to the next part of our life. <laughs> it's very existential. I, I mean, that's I think how it is. But um, we'll wait, we'll wait like another minute or so for people to come in. Um, but thank you for those that are joining us. Uh, we do have a very exciting speaker who's going to be sharing about her HD experience. So we'll wait a few more, I guess not a few more minutes, like, I don't know, 30 seconds. I should play like some music, you know, like a countdown or something. <laughs> Game show countdown. I know, a little Jeopardy <laughs> countdown. Um, but yeah, we'll just, let's just go and get started. Let's do it, let's make it happen. And then as people join, They'll, they'll listen in, but um, hello everyone again. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Seth Rotberg. I've been helping moderate a bunch of different panels this past weekend. Uh, also a family member impacted by HD. So I'm very excited for this session um, to, to really learn from another HD members kind of experience and what it was like to grow up in a family impacted by HD. So uh, you know, Kathy is from Belgium, so it's quite late there. Um, but, you know, she's going to be sharing, again, her, her personal experience growing up in an HD family, what it was like. And, you know, we're really just excited, Kathy, for you to, to take the time out of your day, or should I say out of your night, <laughs> to, <laughs> to be here. So um, for those that are interested in asking any questions, by all means, feel free to post it in the chat or the Q&A feature uh, of this session. You know, if you prefer to make it anonymous, you can also just, I think there's an anonymous option in the Q&A, uh, or you can also just send it to the panelists and um, I'm happy to ask those questions. So without further ado, Kathy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Seth. Good. So, well, hi, everyone. Good night. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, just, yeah, big thanks to you, Seth, uh, Matt, the whole HDO team for, for the whole Congress, really. It's been amazing uh, watching all the speakers and just uh, the opportunity you've given me today to, to share my story with you all. Okay, so I'll be sharing with you my experience growing up in an HD family. All starts um, really sort of when my parents met in 1986. So my dad's British, um, he was sent to Belgium for work and my mom's Spanish. Um, so she was a pianist studying in Belgium. That's them on the, on the left-hand picture, um, actually at the um, reception dinner, uh, wedding reception dinner. And um, on the top right is their wedding picture. So to the right side of my mom is my granddad and my grandma. And on the left side is my aunt and uncle on my dad's side. And on the bottom right is my little family, my parents and me and my sister when we were younger. And um, so HD comes from my mom's side of the family. And um, as you can see in the top picture, so my grandma at the time was showing some symptoms that so she was holding on to my granddad there. Um, and later on, so the memories I have as, as long as I can remember, she, was, she wasn't able to talk much um, or move. So she was wheelchair bound for, for most of um, the life I could remember. And uh, she's no longer with us now, but um, 
yeah, my when my dad um, sort of questioned my mom about my uh, grandma's illness, my mom didn't really know much about the exact name of the illness um, or couldn't really explain what it was or um, why uh, it happened. So um, even when they got married and had me and my sister, my dad wasn't aware of the genetic disposition and risk that it carried um, for, for me and my sister. And when my mom started having mood swings, she became ir really irritable. Um, she was getting angry about minor things and he noticed that change in her behavior and he started doing his own research. As a scientist that he was, um, he dug in and um, dug around, soon discovered more about Huntington's disease. And um, at the time there was a genetic test that recently came out um, that was in 1994. So I was five years old at the time and my mom agreed to get tested. Um, well, they had discussed and, and um, she agreed. The results were positive for HD. Um, but at the time, the doctor comforted my mom saying that she didn't have to worry about anything. So she wasn't showing any symptoms um, and it would be long before she did show anything or had to worry about anything related to HD. So. She held on to those words for the next 20 years and it really fueled her denial about the condition. And that was really one of the last appointments she would have with the neurologist. So the arguments would get worse at home. For the next 20 odd years, we were pretty much alone dealing with the chaos that the illness brought to our family. From as early as I can remember, around four or five years old, the arguments between my parents were really intense. Um, often physical, escalating at night. Uh, police were called to the house a few times. Um, my mom even had a couple of suicide attempts as well during that time. And when I was about eight years old, um, my father just gave in. Um, my parents decided to get a divorce. And that's when he first told us that my mom was sick and that she had Huntington's disease. But that was really confusing for me. Um, she looked absolutely fine. Um, yes, yeah, she was angry, but on the outside, she, she wasn't what you would think a sick person would look like. And I was wondering, was he saying that because they were on bad terms and getting a divorce? Uh, I didn't really know what to believe or how to understand that information. So when he moved out, my mother's anger didn't subside. She needed to release um, the anger and that release turned to us. During the next three to four years, we learned to hide from my mom when she started screaming um, because we knew it would be really bad if we got in her way. Meal times were a really big trigger for her. Um, she would get really frustrated when we didn't finish our food. And uh, I was and still am actually really clumsy. So when I spill my drink was that, which happened quite a lot. Um, she, that really triggered her. She got really angry and it, it led to a really good beating. Um, what was just difficult at that time were the lines between discipline and abuse just became really blurred. Um, with my extended family in Spain, we didn't talk much about HD. So we all knew and accepted that my grandma was sick um, and my mom needed help. They did try to help us talk to her and, and have some interventions, but um, that failed and, and that was really, that was it. I mean, we, it didn't go much further than that. Um, amongst my aunt and uncles and cousins, no one really recognized the risk we all had um, of developing it ourselves. No one tested uh, the beatings between, uh, sorry, the beatings that my sister and I got as kids, they were just normalized as like a normal ass whooping you get as a child when you, um, when, you're, when you behave bad and you deserve it. But we both knew it wasn't normal. Um, it just became taboo to really talk about it because they just shrugged it off. We still didn't understand the facets of the illness, the triggers and how to deal with it. Um, for us, it was just an everyday reality, but my family um, didn't see or, or had to endure. So um, school life was actually an escape for me. Um, 
somewhere I can be, or I can feel normal, forget what happened at home. Apart from a bit of counseling we had when we were younger, um, and where we had some counseling. Uh, the counselor had no idea of HD or how to help us cope. Uh, we didn't really get any special support or attention um, at school apart from that. Even the couple of occasions when my mother um, covered up our bruises with makeup so the school wouldn't notice they didn't. We became a bit older um, and about when we were 12 or 13, we would stay more at my dad's house. Um, the physical fights eventually stopped. Um, I know as awful as this all sounds, I, I mean, I, I have some really amazing memories of my mom and I love her to bits, but just sadly, a lot of these difficulties that we had overshadowed those moments. I learned to start to separate HD from who my mother was, um, but the struggles of my mother never really stopped. She was increasingly impulsive. Uh, so she spent all her money on clothes and all sorts of weird gadgets for the kitchen that were, we never used. Um, she's, she had a couple of serious work accidents during that time. A piano fell on her foot. Um, and another time she fell on, on some steps at work and split her knee in half. And those kinds of stories go on like many of uh, you guys in the HD, in HD families can relate to. Um, it just felt like living a double life, trying to live a normal life whilst finishing school, going to university, um, and, and being with my friends, but always in the background, I'm having to deal um, with my other life and my mother suffering from HD. So that was, um, these pictures of me at my graduation and um, one of the few events my mom was able to travel to um, in the last few years. So it's actually a really funny story behind this. Um, the only way to get my mom to smile in pictures was um, to scream, to scream out cheese <laughs> and keep it going for as long, um, for long en enough to, to take that picture so she can come out smiling because she had struggled with coordinating um, the smile and, and the picture to be taken. So um, there was an element probably of embarrassment of what people might think uh, of us and, and when they see her movements and her career. But honestly, I was just happy to share this moment and um, eventually stop caring what other people thought. So my father actually got remarried just when I was finishing school and starting university um, in the UK. So this was a Leeds University in the UK. And um, I think the fact that he got remarried just really triggered her a lot. She would consistently call me um, during her emotional outbursts. Um, she'd be on the phone for hours crying and complaining about him. Um, and by that time, um, we also had to take a driver's license away. So she would walk, she'd have to walk and take public transport to go to work. She had more accidents during that time where she was robbed and fell and broke her teeth. Um, and then another time she fell on the concrete and, and split her chin open. So the, the distance being in the UK um, away from her was really difficult for me. I, I wasn't able to support her during those accidents um, and, and support her as her physical symptoms really started to show and get worse. So that was really a big drive in my choices in my, for my working life, um, to stay as close as possible to her and try to balance my career progression around, around this. So around 2013, she was able to get medically retired from her job. She was about 55 at the time. Um, with some help from my dad, who, who was still helping her um, with, with her paperwork and, 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 and sorting out her, her retirement with her company. Um, and she started seeing a neurologist and taking medication finally. Um, it was actually a dramatic change in her behavior. She, was, she became super pleasant. Um, I'm really able to build better relationships with her. Um, and I was able to support her um, with, with everyday household chores and, and shopping and things. Um, actually, I remember growing up, she never really, 
said I love you um, and she wasn't she wasn't able really to to say caring things like that and but now with the medication she was so pleasant um, so caring says she loved us all the time would say thank you it was it was amazing um, which it, it was it was a lovely um, change so um, also around that time, I started searching for some kind of support. I was thinking uh, I couldn't be the only one going through this. There must be others out there um, impacted by HD. And I found an HD group on Facebook. And uh, after browsing through all the posts for probably over a year, just silently reading them, I built up the courage to one day post myself and asked if there was anyone based in Belgium. So almost immediately, Matt reached out and put me in touch with the youth group from Belgium. It was a pretty amazing moment for me when I met up with the group. I was in my mid twenties by that time and lived all my life uh, trying to explain my situation to friends who never really seemed to understand, um, which, which was fair. Uh, and it just, but it just felt really lonely. So to finally be able to explain to others my situation and for them to really get it, it was like I walked into a different world. They helped me with my journey to get tested. They gave me advice on how it should be done uh, and where I should do it. They invited me to the Warsaw Conference, The Hague, Sophia, and I just felt like a new start for me. Um, and it was a turning point in my life where I wasn't going to let HD control my life. So that's my little HD family and all the conferences we went to, or HD Yo, I should say. So I started my testing journey and um, this was actually a pretty big deal for my family. Um, I was the first in my family to get tested without having any visible or behavioral symptoms. And apart from uh, my mom who got tested earlier, um, that was it. So as I mentioned also, the, the high risk we all had of developing the illness um, amongst my extended family was just one of those elephants in the room no one talked about. So when I finally shared with my family that I was going through testing, it was a real icebreaker. Um, they were generally supportive, mostly my aunt and my cousins. My dad was terrified. Um, my sister wasn't too happy. She felt like the results would reveal her status um, and I was taking this decision unilaterally for the both of us. I realized how unaware my family was about HD, how little they knew about the risk and how much of a risk it was. So I tested positive for HD in 2016 with a count of 40 repeats. So the positive results actually came as a massive shock to everyone and myself included. I guess I thought I had a pretty good chance of not having it, but I don't regret doing it. I got the ball rolling um, and it triggered the conversation amongst my family. My eldest cousin, who by then had one year old child, she asked me if he was at risk. So my heart really sank when I had to tell her that he was. I felt bad we didn't have the conversation years ago and maybe we could have saved um, another generation of our family. So um, in terms of my relationships and, and close friends and boyfriends, the idea of anyone meeting my mom caused me a lot of panic. It was really a combination of not knowing how my mother would react. Uh, the fact that she didn't want to really meet anyone or she never asked about my friends. And there was probably some level of embarrassment as well. I didn't want my mom, my, my friends seeing her um, and seeing my mom with symptoms which, you know, it's, it's not, it's sad to say, but it, it's the reality really. Uh, so except for my best friend, um, not too many friends even met my mom. Uh, my boyfriend at the time and, and now my husband, he only actually met my mom after four years of our relationship. Uh, I, I warmed him up. I, you know, I obviously told him at the beginning that my mom was sick, had HG, but, it doesn't really register until until you you see a person or until you really know. So I, I warmed him up really over those years, <laughs> and before I think they first met, I was I prepared him a lot. 
um, and I was was really nervous about about that, but it went well, <laughs> well more or less. Um, I just genuinely wanted to break the taboo and secrecy. I felt I had to hide part of my life. So I slowly tried to become more open about it. And the first five years of my career, I never had the courage to tell my colleagues or workplace about HD. I was really extremely selective on who I told. Um, in 2017, I actually got a job offer to go to London. It felt like a really good break and in a great opportunity in my career. But at the same time, I had this inner struggle of needing to be in Belgium to take care of my mom. So I managed to get the courage actually to use that in, in my negotiations with the new company, uh, which actually really worked out for me. And I explained that my mother wasn't well and I needed to stay close without actually mentioning what the illness was or mentioning HD at all, because I was still scared of the potential repercussions that could have for me. So even though they couldn't agree from the offset to let me work remotely, um, they did manage to bump up my salary so I can afford to come back every week and look after her um, with the eventual goal of working remotely full time from Belgium. I actually also got, um, sorry, I, I spent about a year and a half in London um, and then came back to Belgium after that. And I received a, another job offer from London uh, I had a similar conversation about staying in Belgium, and this time I, I did not want to go back to London. Uh, and they let me, they, they agreed to, to let me work remotely from day one. So that despite the difficulties I had to manage um, the distance again when, when I was in London, I feel that um, it, it did pay off and I was able to balance my career with, with HD um, and, and my mom's decreasing health. So this is actually um, my wedding pictures. So my um, very handsome husband on the bottom right, uh, who's actually really stuck by me for, for all these years and, and through my testing process as well. Um, my wedding was actually one of the strangest and most uncomfortable situations for me. Having all my friends and my mom in the same environment, which I've never done before, just made me be, feel really vulnerable and exposed. But I, um, I had a really good time. My, my mom struggled a bit uh, during the day with her medication. And you can see in the top, uh, in the top right where she was in a wheelchair. Um, but later on in the day, she managed to get up and actually even have a dance with me, which was beautiful. So, I mean, there's been a few personal breakthroughs I've had over the years, um, but I'm still and will always be in that journey of navigating the balance between my life and HD. So it will always shape every part of my life, uh, but at least now I feel more in control and not let HD control me. So even until this day where I've been able to share my story with you all, um, it's been a journey in itself. <laughs> I, I really had to filter through all the painful memories uh, when preparing the story. And I just wanted to highlight at least that sort of ray of hope and, and the breakthroughs that I've been able to, to overcome throughout um, and I mean, I, I am actually really privileged because despite HD in my life, my, I had, we had our dad to support us throughout everything. Um, we never had to worry about money. Luckily, uh, I was able to, to pursue my education, to pursue university in my career, um, while also managing and, and helping my mom. I mean, it, it was difficult, like it always is, but um, there's a lot of people which we've heard throughout the last two days, which um, and and people suffering from HD that don't have that uh, privilege. So I mean, I just hope my story can resonate with some of you, and and also help you in your own life with HD. So thank you. So Seth, I, I don't know if there's any questions, but I yeah, think no, I would just. I was clicking the unmute button as fast as I could. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, for sharing and just kind of going through your your story. I think it's it's something my, myself and many can relate to. Um, I know it's never an easy thing, and a lot of people are commenting, just saying thanks for sharing, and that you know 
that they've experienced and just how powerful your story is and you're very brave so you know it's keep that I would say just like remember that that just like you know your your story is is very powerful and so thank you for for sharing um do a few questions so you know one person asked is like how were you able to convince your mom to start taking treatment (laughs) That, that was really really tough I mean so she only she only really started treatment much later so yeah like I mentioned she was about 55 um and she was I think by that time already suffering a good 30 sorry 20 years of the illness um and we we tried to get on medication and it was impossible but I think when when she's maybe it's unconsciously when she started showing physical symptoms I mean with with the accident with the knee she blamed the accident with you know, her difficulties in walking. Um, and she should always blame it on other things, but I'm not sure how there was a breaking point. And with, we worked with her GP and we started um, tackling her symptoms. So we, the GP started talking to her about, you know, oh, maybe you could get something to help you with your anxiety or to, something to relax um, and, and, so she, they, they tackled the symptoms rather than um, the illness. So I think we, I, I was watching the, the session earlier about the behavioral issues. So what really stru- struck me as well from what they said, mentioning the word Huntington's disease is a massive trigger and you're guaranteed failure when you're trying to talk to someone with HD. Um, so trying to see to, to to break it down and to see oh you know you're, you're falling around or you know maybe you can take something to to help you um yeah relax like i mentioned to help you um not move so much or or, or kind of the shaking or the little bits so she, we it was baby steps so we and and thing also during that time it was a lot of my dad's work with the doctors and i was um i was in the uk or i was i was i wasn't in belgium i think i was between uk and spain at the time um and by the time i came back she was what she was going to see the neurologist and the urologist was so patient with her um built that trust over time and and slowly was slowly talked her into getting medication. And once she was on it, she, it was like clockwork. She would take it. She wouldn't miss one. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just kind of slowly implementing that into the everyday routine, which is, I feel like just tougher anyone, right. They're just adjusting your routine or, or bringing something in, especially something that's different. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, maybe you know any tips or advice on you know disclosing hd i know that you just shared your story with us but disclosing it with friends or you know a significant other like you you mentioned you know it took some time to kind of talk with your now husband about it so any like tips or advice on that yeah i mean i think looking back i wish i wasn't so scared so i i I actually i'm more i'm a lot more open now um and, and people that I get close to, you know, and maybe so if I'm going to see my mom at the at her care home, she's at a care home now. So if I if I go to see her on Sunday, I'll and someone's asking, you know, a friend's asking to have a drink. It's like, no, I'm gonna go see my mom at the care home. Like I'm I'm open now to say my mom is sick, um, and I take care of her and I do things for her and 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 I don't try to hide that side of me. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got friends that that are super supportive and really empathetic and compassionate about it. And other friends, which, you know, don't, don't really get it, which is absolutely fine. Um, and I've accepted that, that I can't expect everyone to, to get it and they won't. Exactly. Um, some people deal with these things very differently. Some people are empathetic. Some people just don't like discussing problems in, in, in your life or in someone else's life. They like kind of keeping the, the subject on, on positive notes and happy things, which, you know, if, if they don't, if I don't get that vibe from them, I won't continue, but I'm, I'm not ashamed of, of sharing when I have to. 
Awesome. Um, all right. I'm going to try to see if I, we can add in one more quick question is, um, you know, someone just mentioned that you, you know, if you had to jump a lot of hurdles and that support being a key part of your journey, not just your husband and family, but I guess, are there other things that you're doing that have been helpful to you in this, this journey? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's been a yeah long journey, obviously. Uh, I probably, I have a hard time with self-care and, and focusing on myself, which is definitely an everyday challenge to, to, to remind myself and to work on that. I, I go to therapy as well. I go to therapy now. Um, I, I, I think I'm working as well on my, on the inner voice. You know, I, I think I beat myself up a lot um, about the taboo and about things in my life and in the future, but living one day at a time, you know, and if I, if I don't feel well that day, if I want to sit on the couch and watch Netflix all day, that is okay. That's, you know, I, I shouldn't beat myself up about it. I'm not being, that I'm not being productive or I should be doing something else or I should be exercising or I should be doing whatever. If that's how I feel that day and, and, and if that's my self-care, Mm -hmm. then yeah no it's that's a great way to end so <laughs> thank you Kathy again thank for so much, yeah thank for help everyone and, and, and for giving me this opportunity of course of course we really appreciate it and we have a panel um on research participation experiences on track one if you want to jump over there um and then on track two we will be hearing about enroll hd and then we're, we have a, like kind of some closing remarks, but uh, for everyone, it's been great and a few more sessions to go. And again, Kathy, thank you for, for being open, honest, vulnerable, sharing your story. It's been a, you know, very helpful and inspiring. So thank you very much. Thanks, Seth. All right, take care, everyone. Take care, bye. Bye.